Uh, this presentation is on the single chip series 10 uh, called the SST project at HP. Uh, this is a companion to my SST article in Recall 40, which is the book that uh, Bruce has one left of if you want to try to buy it today. It's a collection of articles on HP calculators over time. Okay, so this is an outline of my talk. Uh, I'll be talking a, a little bit about, there it is, uh, the Voyager context. Uh, what is the SST project, its project goals, the HP organization at the time, the IC design team, the design description, the, the design process we used, some project surprises, and uh, we'll sum it up. And then if we have time, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what's happened with the Voyager series after the SST project. So recognize that Voyager was a big deal to HP at the time. This is an internal newsletter for, at the Crevallis site. It's got a picture of Dick Moore, the general manager of the calculator division, and Dave Packard. And this star was, I didn't add that in Photoshop. That, this was on the newsletter. It says the star of the show is the HP 11. Not Dave Packard, but the star of the show is the HP 11. One of the articles inside that newsletter highlighted that the, the product, Voyager product announcement was on the local TV newspapers, the local TVs, the local newspapers, and was in the technical journals at the time. Chuck, yeah. I'll just ask you one thing I've just noticed. So between 11 and C, there's a little dash. Was, is that just a typo on the cover? Was there originally an intention to put the hyphen there? Uh, it's, it's a newsletter. Yeah. Okay. There was no, no product that was 11 dash C. Okay. Now, inside that same newsletter, the, the cover page has a, 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 a welcome letter to the, the employees where, it, from Ed Scheidler, who was the manager of the components operation. So the, the, the operation that was doing, actually doing the design that's in the Voyager part. And I, I'm not going to read all this, but he highlighted two major challenges for the Corvallis components operation. One was a high pinout quad flat pack package. So this was a brand new package that was replacing the dips that you see in some of the older HP calculators. It's higher pin count, uh, lower profile. Uh, for the calculator products. And then the second, he, he said, Voyager required the largest CMOS chip yet done in our shop. Even though this is too big for large scale production, okay, hint, uh, in our present CMOS process, we built tens of thousands of these circuits and made the introduction of the new calculators possible months earlier. Our new higher density MOS process will be starting up early next year and will make our in-house uh, capability cost effective. So what he's, this is a note that's going out to the employees on the site saying this is our challenge. We've got to make these packages work and we gotta, we've got to get the, the die size down and in a new process so that we can be cost effective. I'll send around the, one of the, the quad flat packs. So the SST project goals. Voyager was doing well right out of the chute. Voyager was high volume for HP. We wanted to cost reduce the Voyager by reducing the number of ICs from two to one in the HP 10, 11, 12, and 16. We wanted to reduce the number of ICs from three to two for the HP 15. And we wanted to use a, a two layer PC board to reduce the cost. SST was used as a short term cost reduction as the Voyager was going to be replaced by Pioneer in one to two years. So there was a lot of time pressure on the project because it was going to be obsoleted by, by Pioneer when it came out. So this is a timeline from an internal celebration, somewhat redacted, uh, that talks about uh, Corvallis site started up in 1975. Do, does anyone know why Corvallis? HP had a, 
a, a strategic initiative to diversify itself geographically. They did not want all of the company sitting in the Bay Area where one earthquake would take everything out. So it was going to geographically disperse its sites. So where do you, where do you disperse them to? Well, they wanted to disperse them close, have the ex other sites be close to engineering universities. So that's number two. Oregon State was an engineering university. Well, why pick that university over, over, over another? Well, it turns out John Young, who was the CEO of HP, was an Oregon State grad. So that's one of the reasons why it was in Corvallis. Good engineering school, uh, history with uh, HP management. Another reason was is it was a, a, an ideal location for a CMOS fab because they recognized that in order to be cost effective on the calculators, they needed to have a, a low power, uh, low cost CMOS process to build the chips with. So that started up in 1975. Uh, in 1980, the Corvallis site split into three divisions, the calculator division, the, the portable computer divisions, and the Corvallis components operation. So the components operation was a separate profit and loss. And that, that plays an important role in a minute. Okay, so this is HP organizations from my perspective. These are all my HP name badges. We called them the, the, the uh, gum wrapper badges because they were about that size. When I joined in, uh, in 1980, uh, it was, uh, this was my temporary badge and I worked my way up. Uh, I was in the portable computer division finishing, so my first project was the display driver for the 75. I then moved on to the pod. After the pod, I was offered a project management position in uh, the Northwest Integrated Circuit Division uh, which was the components operation. So the SST project had already started before I joined as a project manager. It was my first project as a project manager. So how does this project relate to Return of the Jedi? Well, if you remember at the beginning of the Return of the Jedi, Darth Vader lands on an incomplete Death Star 2. And they have this conversation. The Death Star project manager says, Lord Vader, this is an unexpected pleasure. We are honored by your presence. Vader says, you may dispense with pleasantries. Commander, I am here to put you back on schedule. <laughs> the project manager says, I assure you, Lord Vader, my men are working as fast as they can. Vader says, perhaps I can find new ways to motivate them. The project manager, I tell you, the station will be operational as planned. He says, the emperor does not share your optimistic appraisal of the situation. But he asked the impossible, I need more men. Then perhaps you can tell him when he arrives. The emperor is coming here? That is correct, commander, and he is most displeased with your apparent lack of progress. We shall double our efforts. I hope so, Commander, for your sake. The Emperor is not as forgiving as I am. Okay, as a new project manager coming into the SST project that was behind schedule, that was under cost pressure because there was an agreement, a financial agreement between the components operation and the calculator division that the components operation was supplying the, the old parts at the new price after a certain date. So there was financial pressure to get this project uh, back on schedule. So as new project manager, I felt both like the station commander when I was in meetings with my management explaining where we were in our project, and I felt like Darth Vader to the team sometimes saying, well, we, we need to double our efforts and, and get stuff done. Uh, Chris, is it uh, one-to-one -one translation or a repetition hmm? of Lucasfilm? What's the text? Is this one-to-one? One-to-one. Okay. One-to-one. Okay. So we'll start with the design team. SST had an international design team. We did get more people. We had the Corvallis team, and I couldn't have asked for better. 
We had very strong double E's with calculator system backgrounds. We had the HP 41 CPU designer. We had the Voyager IC designer, so the designers of the original chip. In addition, we had a Singapore team of engineers that were on an extended engineering leave into Corvallis. It was all, an awesome group of BS and MS double E's that went on to become the HP Agilent Penang site manager, R&D manager, the HP Singapore site R&D manager, and engineers, directors, and vice presidents at other companies. So this was a stellar group of folks. And as a project manager, I couldn't have asked for better. We got as many names as we could remember. I talked to three of the team members, and we tried to list them over here on the side. Uh, we're missing one or two that none of us can recall after 40 years. Uh, it's not an intentional slight. We worked long, hard hours. We had a blast. We formed friendships that lasted decades. The design. As I mentioned yesterday, the Voyager schematic was hand-drawn on one E-sized blue line. Uh, there was lots of ammonia smell around the building. Uh, this was our primary tool. I'll send this around in case you, any of you have forgotten it. So all the previous designs were full custom layout. So that, that says every rectangle, artwork rectangle, was hand-drawn. And there was a fair amount of skepticism that we could achieve a cost-effective design density for a vol high-volume calculator with anything other than full custom design. SST, the plan on it was to use, we use place and route standard cells for the standard cell part of the logic. So we used custom cells for, for density for RAMs, ROMs, shift registers, phase uh, PLAs, analog, we entered the schematics for the standard cells. So uh, this was the tool we used uh, on Voyager for uh, SST. We actually used our own internal CAD tools. Uh, the, this is the way we checked the artwork. It's, that's the artwork on walls. That's, that's a Calma plot of the artwork. And we plotted our schematics on the, the Big Bertha plotters, HP plotters. This is the SST chip. This is the first single chip implementation of, of Series 10. Uh, again, it's a single chip for the 10, 11, 12, and 16, and two chip for the 15. So this is the first standard cell calculator chip. This is a, a more information on the detail of the chip, the analog, the display shift register, the RAM and the ROM. Uh, on this part, one of our goals was to try to figure out if we could eliminate external components on the part. And there are, one of those components is the big coupling cap, the keep alive cap for when, for when you take the batteries out and you change. Uh, we built as big as we could. We couldn't get it big enough to, to sustain for what we wanted, for the time we wanted to allow people to change their batteries. Uh, phase lock loops. Uh, I mean, PLAs for the, for the CPU. These long things are flip-flops. Uh, this is, for those of you that are process aware, this was a one-layer metal, one-layer poly process. So the flip-flops actually used all the routing channels inside to connect up the, the gates. And so what that meant is, is that flip-flops were affectionately known as routing obstructions when we were trying to, to place and route the, the chip. Uh, there's a, a lot of extra logic around each pad for ESD and latch up protection. Uh, in addition, you'll see a fair amount of routing up here that wouldn't have been necessary, strictly speaking, for the chip. But that, that all was done so that we could change the pad order to enable a two layer PC board. So we had the PC board, we worked directly with the PC board folks to figure out what the pads needed to be. And I'm reluctant to mention it to this group, but I'll, I'll take a chance here. This was, our team was the first to, to mask work and copyright protect the, the uh, calculator chip. And so this is why uh, folks had to get HP's permission 
on the Voyager series to, to access the ROM codes because it was copyrighted uh, and previous, previous uh, calculators were not. Okay. Verification. Uh, we entered our schematics, by the way, using 2648 terminals. That's what that is up there. Uh, we did our DRC and LVS on runs on an Amdahl. Uh, that was the same uh, the computer that was used to run the books at HP. Uh, the DRCs and LVS runs took days. Uh, we used uh, Sandia's controllability and observability program to evaluate the testability of the part. Uh, we used HP Spice and not the 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 uh, um, the sauce to verify critical timing pass. HP Spice was a uh, a custom version of Berkeley Spice that was ginned up with very accurate models for our for our process. Uh, during manufacturing, we used Schlumber's A, Century 7s, and Sentinels for full pattern and electrical spec testings. We did multi-pattern RAM retention tests and ROM verification. For prototyping, we did large uh, prototype builds. We handed uh, uh, a large number of calculators out to just about anybody on the site that would agree to uh, pound on the calculators to try to make sure that they were, they were, uh, they work. Uh, uh, we also had technicians specifically verify every user manual example in the, in all, in 11, the 10, 11, 12, 15, 16 manuals. Okay. This is a, an internal picture of the pre-Voyager the, so the first generation Voyager, so this is pre-SST. Uh, this looks, if you compare this to like a 67 or some of the earlier calculators, this is actually substantially cleaned up. It has two ICs, it has two PC boards. One here, the brown is a polyimid board. That, that board is, is a more expensive board that has tighter trace tolerances. Uh, and a, it has the same coefficient of expansion roughly as, as silicon so that you can do chip on board. Uh, it has a plastic dam around the chips. It has a PC board to PC board connection to connect down to the, the keyboard PC board. It has wires connecting from the PC boards to, to components that also are wired up to, over to the PC boards. Big thank you to Bob. Prosperi for uh, finding one of these systems and letting us take pictures of it. Now, and there's an ESD spring down here. Uh, the Voyager series, uh, even some of the later models, uh, the, over, the keyboard overlay is metalized and the back plate is metalized. And the spring connects front to back to form a Faraday cage around the electronics to, to uh, uh, make it more ESD and latch up. This is an SST system. One two-layer PC board, one chip, a resistor and a capacitor for the, uh, for the oscillator, and a big keep alive cap, ESC spring. So no wires, all surface mount resistors and capacitors, no PC board to PC board connection, no plastic dam, one two-layer PC board and one IC. This is a substantially cleaner, less expensive design. It's also a lot more reliable. Project surprises. Well, the big one you all already know about, which is the HP-12 was not obsoleted by Pioneer and is still going strong. SST project had a very positive ROI and it outlasted its fab processes. It was not, I don't know what's going on there, it was not the last Voyager re-implementation. Another project surprise is how much less robust the semi-custom auto place and route designs were than their original custom designs. Uh, the, the custom designs the margin on those in some places was very tight. Uh, when all appropriate parasitics were considered, the HP Spice was spot on reliably accurate. But we had to make simplifying assumptions uh, to get our simulations to run 
in real t in uh, less than geologic time, and we miss some timing races and voltage dependent behaviors. Uh, one example was found very late in development. You remember I said that we had technicians going through uh, uh, all of the examples in the manual. Well, so when someone pushed on period to, for those of you, you know, change uh, from period to, to comma, okay, uh, we got a display that looked like this. All commas. There was a timing race in. Now, we were running this part in high volume and we used the production test vectors to actually verify the, in simulation the parts. So this wasn't caught by the, it wasn't caught by that. Uh, very, very low PPM. It wasn't caught by that. It, it wasn't caught by all of the, the um, random testing where people were playing with unit. It was caught because we went through every example in the manual. Okay. So this is actually a picture of a marginal unit. So can any of you tell, guess at why it's working? Yeah, why it's working. Well, this is a clue. Okay, that's for those of you familiar with the Voyager series, that's a low battery detect. Okay, and I uncovered the label, so this says that this unit will work at 2.7 volts. Okay, which is why the battery is. So, how is it working now? Okay, this is the back of, the, of that unit, and I'll go ahead and send around the 12C and this 15. Please don't open the 15 because it's got some stuff inside that we'll talk about. Okay, uh, a 15 system looks like a 12 system, except that it has an additional ROM part. The, the 15 uses more ROM, okay. Now let's zoom in on the, the battery compartment. And this explains how the unit's working. Uh, 1.5 plus 1.5 minus a diode drop gets you to the low battery voltage that this marginal unit needed to work. And so we had a minor production run of, of these units so that we could do testing on this rev. Okay. So I've walked through the context. We talked about the project, uh, the design team, the, the project details, the, some of the surprises. Now I'll, I'll uh, do a quick epilogue of post SST, what's happened to HP semiconductors on the HP site. So I've got uh, in the presentation several of these. Uh, this is uh, different versions of the Voyager product over time. The, the original, uh, this is one that was in 2001, a uh, picture taken from Datafile. Uh, someone asked in Datafile, well, why does this have the Agilent name on it? Well, 2001 should be a clue. That's the year after Agilent split from HP. And uh, the fabs went with Agilent. So, uh, and there was a requirement of, just as with the, some of the HP split that's going on now where uh, HP is being required to remove Hewlett Packard from the bottom of the 12 uh, because of the most recent split. Uh, there was a requirement that Agilent, when they sell components, be labeled Agilent, not HP, because they weren't HP anymore. Fun fact is if you decap that, that die and looked inside, it still was the HP mass set because the, the folks recognized that it wasn't appropriate to, uh, to require a mass spin on all of the integrated circuits. But outside it says Agilent. So uh, these two parts, uh, one of these is the HP part and one is the, uh, the Smith's Micro, that's the current versions. So th this is one of the, the various revs of the part that went through. This is, this is before 2001, it's still an HP. Uh, this is uh, 
one of the more recent HP implementations of the, the 12C. Uh, there's a weight in the, in the back of the calculator uh, to give it some heft. Uh, there's a conductive re rubber reset button. Uh, and if we zoom in on the PC board, there are, there's a voltage regulator and two surface mount uh, resistors over here, 33 surface mount components around an Atmel part. Uh, the Atmel part, I looked up the specs on it, it's 128K flash, 6K bytes of RAM, SRAM, seven segment driver, US, USART, uh, and SPI. So the advantage of, of this is, is they could use a standard off the shelf part. The disadvantage is, is you get uh, a lot more system complexity. And this is a Swiss Micros. Also using standard parts. So a little bit more complex than the originals. Okay. So a little bit of background on, in case you're curious, what happened with HP and semiconductors. Uh, as I mentioned, the B3 fab was, put, was brought up specifically for low leakage CMOS with one layer poly, one layer metal for calculators. It was so low power that the, the service department, calculator service department at HP, the first thing they did when they received a calcul Voyager calculator in for service was turn it over, change the batteries, and about half the calculators worked. The users didn't realize after three years that their calculators needed batteries. <laughs> Little different than cell phones today. Okay. Uh, a, a second fab, B2, higher volume, lower defect CMOS fab, uh, was done for more advanced uh, process nodes for HP product use, calculator, and the whole company. Uh, uh, HP at one point offered foundry service to supercomputer companies, uh, PC graphic chip makers, and error correction. Uh, we've got chips and satellites and that kind of stuff. Uh, HP transitioned from internal CMOS ICs to, foundry, to being a foundry service customer and transitioned the B2 fab, closed the B3 fab, and transitioned the B2 fab to inkjet head manufacturing. Uh, the internal CAD was replaced by industry CAD. The HP Corvallis site in 1980, when I joined, was building three, four, and five had just been constructed. We played Frisbee in an empty, in, indoors in the upstairs of B5, the, the building was empty. Uh, B3 had the CMOS fab in it, ATE, our test of equipment and offices. Uh, B5 was empty. Uh, B4 was the front lobby, cafeteria, office, plastic molding. Uh, all, the calculators were made start to finish in Corvallis. The, the uh, integrated circuits were fab there. The um, plastic molding, the molding machines were on site. The tooling to make the plastic molding machines, the, the milling machines and whatnot, computer milling machines, were all on site. The wave solder to solder the, PC, to solder, uh, the components onto the PC board, all of that was on site. And the final assembly and test was on site. It's quite simple. Yep. Uh, Later, the, they added a cafeteria. Uh, even later, other buildings as the inkjet business unit grew. At, one at the time before the compact acquisition, HP's compact acquisition, the Kafala site was the biggest site in HP. This is a picture of in-between growth. And this is what uh, the Corvallis site is today. Uh, HP's still there, it's not occupying all the building. The site's now a business park. Uh, they demolished one of the unused office buildings. Uh, and fun fact, there's a nuclear uh, power plant uh, startup that's on the site along with uh, uh, other things there. It, it's actually a small, it's not fusion, it's fission, but it's for a small scale uh, nuclear power plant that the idea is, is that it fits in a footprint that's smaller than like a cargo container. So it's meant for community scale 
and it doesn't re it's it's safe at, to the point where it doesn't require the containment vessels and that kind of stuff we we actually went over and talked with folks to, a little bit to find out more about how they uh, ensured the quality of their work as a way so we could look at the quality of ours. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned, I've got several of the, I've, I've got several versions of this. I have now three of these mini posters. If, if someone wants them, I, I won't have to carry them home. Uh, I, when I was doing some research for this presentation, I came across this quote from uh, Vladek uh, from Datafile. Voyager system, why do this? It was an article on looking inside the, the Voyagers. Why do this? So far as the user is concerned, all 12 Cs work the same way and give the same results. Yet to some HP fans and hardware hackers, this is not the whole story. We want to know how it works and, and how it changes. And th to me, uh, this, some of these pictures show exactly that. Okay. That's it, SST. Now, <laughs> thank you. Now, now yeah, sure. With these new uh, processors, that does mean that all calculators using these new processors, they will go on even if one of the coin cells drop dead? Uh, in the old ones, yeah, you, the old ones you could run on two coin cells instead of three. Mm -hmm. As long as you had connected, yeah. As long as you had connectivity through. 